If you'd like to make a start, please. Thank you, Hannah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, teaching session um, organized jointly by Orthopedic Research UK and the Orthopedic Academy. The guest uh, speaker this night is Mr. Dave Clock. Mr. Clock is a consultant, experienced consultant, upper limb surgeon um, for over 20, 12 years. He's particularly interested in shoulder and elbow trauma and arthroplasty and arthroscopy. But on top of that, um, what makes him a stellar speaker tonight is that he is an FRCS examiner. Obviously, we all understand he has rules and regulations to follow, but he will do his best um, to help us. Uh, he's also experienced trainer. He is, speciality in, he, he is a member of the Specialty Advisory Committee and the regional specialty uh, advisor to the Northern region. Uh, he has been previously on other educational committees, including the uh, British Elbow and Shoulder Society. And he's involved actively in FRCS teaching, exam teaching, teaching trainees, as well as being an examiner. He writes questions. Um, he has extensive knowledge with, related to the exam. So we're very pleased and excited that he accepted our invitation to join tonight. And I'm sure all of us uh, will learn from him. My name for us, Arnaud, I'll be modulating the session. I'll be taking your questions and um, helping you run the session along with uh, Hannah and Lydia from Orthopedic Research UK. Tonight, there won't be any MCQs. Obviously, that's because of the exam of the regulations regarding to Mr. Clock being an examiner. So no MCQs and no Viva questions. However, we, Mr. Clock will make this as relevant as possible. He will give us a lot of experience of some candidates, and he will keep this teaching today focused on what the FRCS candidate need to know uh, for the exam. And we will encourage you all, please ask questions. There are no silly questions. Please ask your questions, uh, any questions related to the topics or to the exam, uh, we will get this answered today. Um, if you miss any part of this, I'm sure it will be intensive. If you miss any part, don't worry, it's recorded and we'll try to share it with you uh, later on. So with that uh, further ado, I will leave you now with the Mr. Clock, over to you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, right, so it looks like that's screen sharing. Is that correct? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, yeah, thanks very much for overly thorough int introduction. Um, yeah, I, I'm Dave Cloak, and I what I'd like to try and share with you is a sort of perspective, a true perspective of the exam as I see it as an examiner. And then I'm going to move on to some shoulder and elbow topics as well, but we'll we'll keep it fairly fluid. As Faraz said, I, there are certain things that as examiners we can't do, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you look at it. Um, we're allowed to talk about the exam. We're allowed to share principles. Um, clearly, we shan't, can't share any actual questions, hence, hence the difficulty there. And, you know, even if I made up a question, then probably that's a question if it was good enough that I shouldn't share with you and I should give to the exam anyway. So, so we're not going to do any of that, but I'll go through this for sort of half an hour and then I'm absolutely happy to take it as you, as you want. Um, I've got some, some of our trainees recent experience from the exam a couple of weeks ago, which I think would be reasonable to share um their perspective of what they had in the exam so it's not quite the same as me telling you what was in it i think 
um, and keep that sort of fairly generic. So we'll uh, we'll get started. So yeah, I, you know all this already. So there's no point in that slide, but that's who I am. And I work in Northumbria. Um, so from the exam point of view, I think the real thing I want to get across is the actual fact about the exam. And it, it, it's surprising and in some ways very unfortunate how skewed an idea of the exam you can get as a, as a candidate coming up to it, which I think is really unfortunate. But um, so what I want to give you is, is the basis and the rationale of the exam in order to understand it and what we're about and what we're trying to achieve and how you can achieve it. Um, and then as the second part, which is probably about the last third or so, just some talk about shoulder and elbow topics, not really telling you about them, simply giving you the level of knowledge to which you would be expected to know them. What it isn't, therefore, is a didactic talk on shoulder and elbow topics, I'm afraid, because I don't think that's a good use of your time. Um, those are things you can get somewhere else. I think what, the, what a good use of your time is for tonight is to, is to have me tell you how the exam runs and how you can understand it better, um, you know, from that point of view, rather than just telling you a load of stuff that you can get from elsewhere. So yeah, myths and rumor. Um, I think it is in some ways unfortunate, and this is why I, I did talk about to some of the senior members of the exam board before, before doing this, um, and they felt it was a good idea. Because we're not allowed to teach on exam courses, almost by definition, I say this very carefully, because clearly the whole ethos of these sessions is to build you up for the exam, but without some input from examiners, how do you know how the exam runs? And that's, that's why I'm here, obviously. There's also the, potentially very unfortunate, although it seems useful, um, aspect where you talk to someone who's just done the exam because their experience can be absolutely skewed one way or the other. They, it's such a fluid environment, particularly the, the Viva, there is no way of knowing how they did in that particular section, in that particular question. Um, they may have felt it went really well and they really did badly, so they're gonna tell you something that, that wasn't really the case. Equally, someone who tells you they get asked about X paper and Y paper and evidence for this was probably a candidate who was doing well above the expected level. And then you go away and try and learn all that stuff, whereas actual fact, you don't need to. So, so just be very careful when you're talking to, to previous candidates, although clearly knowing what they were asked is, is useful to some extent. And as I said, unfortunately, and I'm being careful that that does go for courses because courses by definition We've occasionally had people who run courses try and come as observers on the exam, and that's not allowed um, because potentially they could find the questions and put them in their course. So it is all a bit unfortunate because you, ideally, if you're running a course, you want to see how it actually worked, but you're not allowed to do that. And bear in mind that all of the questions are designed to test not just knowledge, because, and it sounds silly because you need the knowledge, but it's not a test of knowledge, it's a test, ideally, although not always, of problem solving, higher order thinking and having the skills that you need to be a consultant, not simply, you know, some baseline knowledge. And I know candidates with excellent knowledge who haven't got through the exam. For Someone muted me there, I think. Anyway. Um, so just bear that in mind that, you know, it's not just about knowledge. Remember this, if you're in a training program and you come up to the exam, you've got a 70% chance of passing at each sitting, which is very high. It's not, it's not that a, fair, a few pass, most people pass. It is lower, a lower pass rate if you're not in a training program for various reasons, obviously, including probably the lack of of training, but the the pass rate if you're in a training program is 70%, and that is really worth bearing in mind all the way through. Uh, I just wanted to share this with you. This is my feedback over the last two exams, and this shows you the mean score I give for each candidate at each level, and it tells you I'm kind of in the middle. So I'm not probably the the hawks, so to speak, are on the left where their scores are they're giving quite low scores. The doves are on the right, they're giving high scores, but you need that as well. I tend to be fairly average and in the middle. So hopefully 
I'm using this as a bit of evidence to tell you I'm fairly fair about what I do and say. You know, I'm not giving you very skewed ideas about what, it, what it's all about. Um, but you do need a spread of examples. You see, I can't remember the figure, but you, you meet a large number of examiners throughout the exam, each of whom judges you on your own merits for that session. So it stands to some reason you will have good sessions and you'll have bad sessions and you will hopefully make it up. At the end of the day, you have to essentially average a six on all of those, on all of the questions you get. And if you do that, you pass. And if you don't, you don't. And that's the, there is a line and that line is regulated by the GMC. Um, but, you know, it might worry that some, you know, what if I get an examiner who's particularly harsh? Well, you might do, but there's not many of them. And if you do, you're equally likely to see someone who's less harsh or fairer. So, yeah, there's a spread and that's that's how life is and that's how we all are. So what is the standard? Well, this I read this back to myself yesterday. And I thought this this sounds wrong, but this is this is the standard that you are being judged against at every section of the exam. And that includes, as I'll tell you, the written paper. Each examiner who looks at your response to a question is judging you against the level of someone who isn't great, who isn't even necessarily someone they would want to treat their family, but someone who is just good enough to be a day one consultant. And if that principle bears out throughout the exam, you pass the exam if you demonstrate that standard. And if you over, if you get more than that, you know, you get higher marks and that's great. If you don't demonstrate that standard, you don't pass. And that is the overriding principle. So at each section, each question, that's what you're being judged against. So you don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to be good enough. So it might be someone that you might say, well, this person, would make a reason, they would make a colleague, we might give them a job, but we're gonna be a bit careful. We're not gonna just let them start doing lots of stuff. And maybe not someone you want to treat your family, but then, you know, we know that of all of our colleagues, all the people you see at every stage in your career, there are lots of people who you not, wouldn't necessarily want to treat your family, but you're not reporting them to the GMC either. So, you know, just they're just good enough to be in their job. So we'll talk a bit about part one which ideally is clinically based, although I know when you, the, the problem is all the questions in the bank, and that goes for the written questions and the vivas, a lot of them have been there a while and they do get culled, they do get looked at, but you're going to occasionally get questions that don't quite follow this. And we're sorry for that. Getting people to write questions is very difficult. And by the way, as soon as you're a consultant, you can join the question writing committees and that'd be great. Um, but, you know, this is the ideal, whether this actually happens, you know, remains to be seen a little bit, but this is the ideal. So the questions should be clinically based and they should be written in such a way that all of the answers could be correct. And that really throws people if you and I haven't read also bullets questions recently, but if you go away and look at questions that maybe give you one obvious answer and the rest of nonsense or you look at something that is true, false, or any of these other ways of asking multiple choice type questions, you're going to be shocked when you get in there because the ideal question gives you five options and they could, they are all feasible. And a couple of you might immediately say, well, actually that's nonsense, I wouldn't do that, okay. But actually choosing the best one should be difficult. So it should be a judgment call and it's not a black and white thing, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, but you just have to choose what you think is the best answer. So don't be shocked if you look at it and think, these could all be right. That's how it's written, and that's how it is, and that you need to remember when you do the exam. If it seems difficult, don't worry about it for several reasons. Firstly, if, if no, no one gets it right, it doesn't get marked. It comes out at the standard setting, as I'll tell you. If everyone gets it right, it doesn't get marked because there's no point having it. And then there's lots of statistics, which I still don't fully understand, which tell you how, how good a question it is. So you want questions that kind of the good candidates get right, the not so good candidates don't get right, and they're discriminatory. Um, if any questions look dodgy, i.e. all the good candidates get it wrong, or everyone gets it right, or so on, then you... Um, you know, those are going to be looked at by us and those are going to come out and they may go back to the question writing committee. So if it seems like a really difficult question, 
don't worry about it because if everyone gets it wrong or it's very difficult to get, you, it's going to score lower anyway. The reason for that is that when we sit down and do the standard setting, we don't do the exam and then decide a pass mark. What we do is we look at each question and we judge it against that standard of the day one consultant. And you give it a score out of 10. And what you're saying is, here's a question. How many day one consultants who are just good enough would get this right? So if it's an easy question, you might say, well, eight or nine might get it right. And if it's a very difficult question, you say, well, one or two might get it right. Um, obviously, out of five, two is a guess anyway, so it never gets below two. But you therefore get a level of difficulty for each question. And then the whole thing gets statistically churned up and you end up with a pass mark. So when the pass mark is 69.25 percent, that's why, because there's a very rigorous statistical process that's gone through. You then have to remove the standard error of the mean because the GMC points out that you can't have anyone passing through chance. So you can't have, well, the, let's say the pass mark is 60 and this person got 60. Well, there's a chance that that was, they're not as good as a 60. So they, you know, the, the, the mark gets changed for that. So, so that's it. So the aim is that the pass mark is based on that average day one consultant who's just good enough to be doing their job. So it's standard set in that way. So it's not about saying everyone has to get 50% or the top X candidates get it. You're being judged at each point against that standard. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but bear in mind that this, this is the JCIE marking descriptors, and you will hopefully see this on the desk of every examiner because we're meant to be referring to it. And it's on the JCIE website. So this is perfectly public knowledge, and you should look at this. And hopefully it'll reassure you. Because the thing I want to point out is this bit here, which says that the pass mark, it's just that's for the nut. So it's if we go back, it's for the knowledge bit. The candidate should demonstrate for a mark of six competent knowledge of common problems. And they should mention the essential points have a logical approach and not need to be coached through it. So that's the level six. Again, it's the just competent person. It's not a stunning mark. It's not knowing everything. It's not quoting the literature. It's just knowing enough to be good enough to be a day one consultant. And when we, the Saturday of the exam, we'll all sit down around as, as a, like the trauma people will sit down with the trauma questions. We'll look through them. If there's things we don't think are good questions, we throw them out. We end up with a, a certain number of questions for each section. And we decide where the level six is. So in a, let's say, supracondylar fracture of a, of a humerus in a kid, where's the safe level? Now, obviously, that's a common problem and it's important. So actually, we might suggest that the safe level is actually quite high on that. You should know it pretty well. Whereas if it's a question about something a bit more esoteric, maybe just demonstrating a reasonably safe approach is a level six. So it varies between the question, but we will decide as a group. So in theory, everyone coming into the exam and having that question is being judged against a similar standard. And you do not need to be quoting evidence for a level six. You do not need to quote evidence for a level six. I'll mention that again several more times. If you do, if you know the literature, in fact, let's go back. You probably, well, it depends on your screen. It says down here, quoted from the literature, that's a level eight. For knowledge and judgment, had an understanding of the breadth and depth of the topic and quoted from literature. That's level eight. If you're aiming for level eight, fill your boots, go and do that. But if you're aiming to pass the exam, you don't need to do that. It would be reasonable to know some guidelines if they're out there, but we are instructed that we can't be asking UK guidelines of all the candidates because some of the candidates won't be from the UK. And even as you know, even the guys who work in Ireland are not, you know, BOA guidelines don't actually apply to their practice. So you can't be asking for those. If you volunteer them, that demonstrates you know what you're talking about and that's good. The clinical, um, so it, usually intermediate case, you've got three by five minutes, upper and lower limb. You're gonna have five minutes for the history. There'll be a bell as a guide, not necessarily a, a hard end point. Three minutes to examine the, the patient and three minutes to discuss. And it may be something very weird and wonderful, and you will not be expected to know it inside out if that's the case. So don't worry about it. If you go in and you take a sensible, thorough history, you're nice to the patient for which you get marks, you do a competent examination and you discuss the case and what you would do, 
you know, that might be a very low level for a, a, a simple, uh, a complex case. Obviously, if it's a very straightforward case, you'd be expected to know it in more depth. But don't worry if it seems uh, if it seems difficult. For the short cases, there are no tricks. If it's a picture of a Jupiter's hand, I say picture, we'll come back to that. If it's a Jupiter's hand, talk about Jupiter's. Don't look for something weird and wonderful. You've got five minutes to do this. So really want to demonstrate a level of knowledge and just, you know, wasting your time looking for other stuff like elbows and so on is probably not appropriate. You know, just examine the patient, tell me your findings, and if it seems simple, then it's simple. And there are a lot of simple things around because simple things and common things are common. So don't overthink things too much. I think I've lost a slide. Oh, there we go. Um, but, 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 but. So in COVID, we've had virtual clinicals and they are here to stay certainly until the end of the year. And then the intermediates may go back to volunteers, not patients, and they may be in the hotel conference venue type of setting rather than hospital. So that may happen, but probably the short cases are going to stay as virtual. And by that we mean you sit down at a Viva table like you do for the Viva, and you get shown a picture of something or a video of something, and you, you discuss it. And clearly that could turn into a Viva, but the aim is that we keep it clinical. So what you shouldn't do is just expect to sit down and say, and someone says, how are you going to examine this patient's shoulder? And you just tell them how to do it because that's medical student level. That tells us nothing. What you will be expected to do is justify what you're doing. You can't necessarily demonstrate it, but why would you examine the ACL in this arthritic knee? Why would you look for this? Why, you know, whatever it is, you would be expected to know what you're doing and why and how that changes your management. So don't expect it to be a walk in the park and just tell them how you'd examine a joint. But as I said, that for the short cases, generally it's just looking at a video or or a, um, or a or a photo or set of photos and, and discussing the case, but you may well be back to, to proper intermediate cases by the end of the year. Onto the Viva, um, you should know what's in it. So there's adult pathology, peds and hands, basic science, I should say, sorry, applied basic science and trauma. And at each table, you're gonna be there for half an hour. You're gonna get three lots of five minutes with one, three lots of five minutes with the other. And as I've said, they're standardized questions. They're out of the question bank. No one's brought in their weird cases from home on their laptop anymore. These are highly vetted, quality assured questions that have been discussed and standard set at the meeting. So if it seems a bit weird, you know, maybe it is, but what's being expected of you is you, you assess the scenario appropriate as the day one consultant. Um, if uh, you know if it is very difficult maybe maybe you're missing the point I don't know but that's how it is and there'll be th the questions are written in three parts and there's a sort of progression through it as you might expect so there's an introductory bit what do you think of this x-ray what are you going to tell this patient um, how are you going to assess this patient and you're getting a little introduction um, and usually there's a picture usually an x-ray to start with then there's, it moves on to sort of mid-range knowledge. So let's say it's an arthritic shoulder and you know, there's an X-ray and you might, you, know, you might be able to pick out whether it's osteoarthritis or cuff tear arthropathy. I just say that because I know about it. Your mid-range knowledge, well, why does that make a difference? And then sort of justifying why you might do a reverse arthroplasty or an anatomic arthroplasty. And then the higher knowledge might be, well, actually, how do you do it? What's your approach? What are the key features of doing it? And you see, hopefully you see that. So there will be a progressive thing that you'll be expected to go through. So don't, when you get to the end of five minutes and the bell goes and someone says, do you know any papers? Don't think, oh my God, they asked me for papers and I didn't know it. The point is that you got to that point and probably you've done well. So just put the whole thing in perspective of it. And as we've said, the six will be a sort of safe and competent level of thinking. So getting sort of halfway through it to a safe level is all that's expected. And then you might be pushed. Um, and we'll come back to, to how you can go a bit wrong with that in a minute. So the general advice about the exam, it is a high pass rate. And it's easy to say, but treat it as a one-to-one -one chat as you with, would with either a colleague or a trainer you get on well with. Or if you, just, if you come in and you're pleasant and you're smiley, and I know that's difficult, I get that, but if you do, it's going to go a lot better because everyone, you know, we're sat there for, you know, 
nine or 10 hours of the day, especially on the clinical day. And it's nice to see people who are a bit upbeat and a bit happy and it, it goes a long way. Um, just answer the question sensibly. Just demonstrate a safe approach. And we'll come back to what that means and doesn't don't mean in a minute. And it might be wise just to orientate yourself to the question. So if you if you come in, bear in mind, as we say to you when you come in, this is your trauma viva or this is your basic science or whatever it is. If you get if, if there's a so the same thing may appear in both, which, by the way, it won't because we keep a track of what you've been asked. But let's say you might see a loose hip replacement X-ray in basic science. You can probably surmise that it's going to go down the route of maybe polyethylene wear or 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 the mechanisms of wear or what's something along those lines whereas if you're in the adults and pathology fiber it might be going more down the realms of how you're actually going to do a revision hip replacement do you see what i mean so with you know, where are you where might this go and what i say to people is kind of when you sit down and you, you're there have a second think about it a second or two you can do a lot of thinking in a second or two just think right where do you think this might be going and if it's the if it's a loose hip replacement, your mental filing cabinet, you could say, well, I, I think this might go down the route of polyethylene wear or wear debris or polyethylene manufacturer. All these things should be sort of coming to the front of your mind so that you're ready to go down the route because you don't know which way it's going to go, but you, you can have a sort of fair idea where it's going to go. Um, do follow cues and guidance. No one's trying to trick you. If someone asks you three times, are you really sure? Ask yourself if you're really sure, generally speaking. And if you are, that's maybe okay. But just pick up on some cues. If there's a bit of guidance, then then that's probably what's needed. Don't. I've heard people say all sorts of things. Oh, well, I was told you should just sit there and just keep talking until they stop you. That's fine if you're going down the right route. But if the question says you want to get to this discussion point and you don't get a chance to because you've gone off down the wrong route, you're not going to be answering the question. Equally, you know, if you do know something well and you think you can say a lot about the topic first off, maybe you do want to say more. So don't, you know, don't be too rigid in it, I suppose, is the point. Do say what you know about something as long as you know that you're saying the right thing. And again, there aren't any games or tricks. Try not to repeat yourself. You've got five minutes to demonstrate your knowledge. You can waste a lot of time by basically telling the examiner what they've already told you. And the cliche thing, they seem to change on a year by year basis. And what I'm talking about is currently everyone says in an appropriately marked and anesthetized patient. And you think, well, obviously, why are you saying that? So someone somewhere has told exam candidates that you must always say in an appropriately marked and consented and anesthetized patient. And it makes us giggle a little bit because, you, you know, I'm not going to do a hip replacement in inappropriately marked or unconsented or, you know, no one's going to keep, no one's going to trick you out and go, ha, actually you said all the right things, but you didn't say you consent the patient. Well, yeah, it, it, no one's trying to trick you. You don't need to necessarily say these things. So if you're in the trauma vibe, of course, there are questions about major trauma. Of course there are. Equally, there are questions where the examiner may say, okay, this is an isolated neurovascularly intact injury of this elbow. You don't have to say ATLS, okay? We've told you not to say that basically. So just be guided and be sensible and don't, you don't have to say these things. The paper issue, you know, again, guidelines may be helpful and hope you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't fail if we were talking about supracondylar fracture in a kid and not mention mm -hmm. boast whatever it is. But equally, if you did mention both, whatever it is, you're probably demonstrating a, you know, a, a more appropriate level of knowledge. So guidelines are helpful, but not absolutely necessary. And papers certainly aren't necessary. Please believe me on that. Don't overthink and overcomplicate it. If it is simple, it probably is simple. And do learn the knowledge, which is important because that's kind of the point, but it's a more about applying it rationally to demonstrate problem solving. So I, I have this sort of utopian thought that rather than unfortunately as it is you build up to the exam for three or four years you're you know you know when it's going to be you hide yourself away from your family for weeks or months on end you pay a fortune you're absolutely scared about it someone told you you have to know all these papers um someone says you have to do this someone else said something different 
and you, you go into it and you're sweaty and it's all horrible and it's the worst day of your life wouldn't it be nice if we just kind of said well actually here's things you should look at oh, it's called a curriculum it is there here's things you should look at on your way through and at some point in this year or so someone's going to just take you aside and do your exam so you don't have the build-up you don't have the worry you just get on with it and i'm sure everyone would be just fine because i think by the stage certainly in the training program by the stage you get to the exam by and large you probably are ready anyway so that's just my thought but it, it is about just demonstrating that you're at the right stage of your training really and that knowledge is a bit of it but it's not the whole point so we will move on a little bit to shoulder and elbow bearing all that in mind so i'm not, not again going to tell you everything you need to know about shoulder and elbow i'm going to give you some pointers as to what sort of level might be expected in various topics so in principle, do be safe, but not too safe, I suppose. But, you know, neurovascular things are there. There are questions where, you know, you would be expected to mention, if someone said, how are you going to assess this injured limb? You would be expected to mention a neurovascular examination. And you may be told that's normal and that's fine. But if you're not, good job you mentioned it. So. It is certainly reasonable if you got through a question at no point had you examined the radial nerve or whatever, that that would be considered a, a fail. So do mention those things. But if someone's told you you don't need to mention them again, take up on that as well. Just be logical and rational and sensible. Don't be operating on everything. Have a thought process that involves conservative treatment. But it's a surgical exam. No one's going to ask you exactly how you're going to you know what you're going to write on the orthotics form they're going to ask you well okay let's say we've tried that what are you going to do in terms of surgery so expect that but do consider all the options that's important and that's what we do and it's, it's all about just doing what you do in clinic so let me just get rid of that so uh we'll start with shoulder trauma neurovascular injury is, is important so we'll talk about proximal humeral fractures clavicle fractures and instability i think those are sort of fairly key topics um be aware of options be aware of pros and cons in proximal humeral fractures if you know classifications that's great people generally do consider conservative treatment don't operate on all of them that's certainly a sensible approach but probably you'll be taken down the route of you know if you're going to operate what are you going to do know the options and why they're done so risks of AVN, patient age, pre-existing problems, all those sorts of things are going to push you away from fixation. The controversies of hemi and reverse total shoulder, know why you wouldn't generally do an anatomical total shoulder for acute trauma. And just know some approaches, know the pros and cons of a delta pectoral or a deltoid split and the broad ways you would do them and the techniques. And that all of that is, is sort of level six knowledge. If someone said, well, actually, Proffer tells us that as long as you get it right, then that's great. Um, and we don't need to go into that now. But, you know, what does Proffer guide our guide our management? If you know that there's Proffer 2 ongoing, that to me is definitely in the level 7, 8 category. You don't have to know it to pass, but if you know about it, that would be great and it would be reasonable to put it in there. Clavicle fractures, very controversial and we see a lot of certainly in the shoulder world a lot of dare i say it, unnecessary surgery perhaps um so know know why you would want to do an operation and why you might not want to do an operation and know what the risks and benefits are for the patient in front of you because that if i were to ask a question on clavicle fractures i'd probably say okay here's the patient what are you going to tell them of the risks and benefits of the operation and you know, the shortening thing, I think, is probably that's always quoted and there's no real evidence for it, certainly in the UK. Um, the non-union risk. If something's comminuted and high energy, it's still got at least a sort of 60, 70 percent chance of healing. So if you told me you're going to fix everything, that has got a you know, 70 percent chance of being fine. I'm going to ask you some probing questions about it. So if you're going to do surgery, know why and know that it's all a balance of relative risks and benefits. It's not about, well, it's two centimetres short, then I'm going to fix it. It's, it's just not like that. Shoulder instability, I put this in the trauma section. Um, 
you know, a reasonable knowledge of cl classification. I think for shoulder instability, the really key thing is identifying, you know, we're talking mainly here about anterior, but identifying the pattern of instability, the, the Stanmore triangle, I think is it, you know, that's probably a six or at least a knowledge that these are the factors involved, i.e. The, the structural, the atraumatic structural and the muscle patterning are, are all aspects of the pathology that you should um, that you should be aware of maybe not necessarily mentioning the Stanmore triangle exactly but you get my point that it having a knowledge of how you're going to base your decision making based on the pathology and based on that pathology how are you going to you know how are you going to treat the patient so that kind of thing to me that's that's a, a, a sort of progressive you know why might you have an unstable shoulder you get into this okay what are you going to do well this patient has a traumatic structural lesion but they also have some hyperlaxity how would that alter things is it a revision all these things to, to discuss acute cuff tears i think is a very important topic um in the older and i'm older anyone over 40 with a uh, with an anterior dislocation you've got to consider um acute cuff tears so um so i think that should that would be reasonable to know about that Elbow trauma, we'll, we'll talk about these. I put electronon fractures there and then I thought, well, I'm not actually sure there's much to say about them. They're not particularly controversial, but um, reasonable fodder for the exam. I think in radial shaft fractures, one of the big things that probably comes up is the radial nerve management, how that alters your, your management. If they have a radial nerve palsy, primarily, secondarily, exploring it, all of these things that are very common and are important things to know about. Um, Conservative and operative treatment, why you might choose one over the other. Um, and if, you, if you're if you aware of the HUSH trial, which I'll just mention, then I think that's, that's again, getting into sort of seven, eight territory. Um, it's an important study, we hope. Um, and it just demonstrates to me, if you take it back a step, it demonstrates to me that we don't really know what the best treatment for humeral shaft fractures are. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a major multi-centre trial. So... Um, if you're going to choose a treatment, know how to do it. And I think I mentioned earlier, no one's going to ask you about conservative treatment, but in, in this aspect, I think knowing how you, how you would treat someone in a humoral brace, not just put it on and get them back in six weeks, actually how you would manage them actively would be important to know as well. The distal humerus, I won't talk about kids. Um, that's a sort of separate thing, but unsurprisingly being a very important topic and very common, supragondylar fractures often get asked about. When it comes to adult distal humerus fractures, most of them are going to need surgery, but bear in mind the pros and cons. Is there, a, is there a, a role for conservative treatment in your particular patient? And be expected to discuss that. What are you going to tell the patient? They ask this, they're worried about that. What are you going to tell them? So um, that's, that's something I would like to hear from people. Uh, what are your aims of surgery? You're trying to fix it so you can get it moving. And most people who get this sort of question do know about O'Driscoll's principles, which, you know, they quote, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to quote that. You just have to know that you're going to have to do whatever you need to do to get the elbow stable enough to get it moving because stiffness is an issue. And knowing about arthroplasty as an option, hemi and total elbow replacement, if you know that there are options for that, that's probably a reasonable level seven. And if you know that there's a bone and joint journal review this month on that very topic that would definitely be an eight but you don't need that to pass i'm just saying that you know if you see these things in the in the months before the exam just store them away and if you brought that up i'd be very impressed elbow instability um i i quite like questions on this because i think it's quite a discriminating thing uh it's a not a well understood topic. So I, I think knowing about how the elbow is stabilized, static and particularly dynamic stabilization. So you want to get elbows moving, what the patterns of instability are in their pathology. So posterolateral, which is a terrible triad and posteromedial. If you know about that, I think that's getting you well above a six. And what are you aiming to do? Do whatever you need to do to get the elbow moving. And often quoted is, is getting it being able to extend the elbow to within 30 degrees of full extension with stability is probably what you're aiming for. Um, and then you ask, well, is that under anesthetic or otherwise? And no one really agrees on that. But anyway, 
fixing, repairing, doing whatever you have to do to make the elbow stable enough to move it is what you what you're after. So you could have a whole discussion about this. You know, this if I was to sit and write a question about this, that's the sort of way I'd be looking at it. You know, knowing what are the elbow stabilizers, you know, here's an x-ray, what's going on, what's injured, therefore, what are you going to do? You know, that's a, a good test of your knowledge to, to the consultant level, I think. Uh, I mentioned biceps, uh, distal biceps I'm talking about. <clears throat> there is less of a, pardon the pun, knee-jerk reaction about surgery now. People are trending to weigh away from automatically offering people surgery because they've got a ruptured biceps because there are pros and cons. And we know that a lot of people do well enough following a distal biceps injury to be, to be functional. But, you know, it's a discussion. Knowing how to assess it clinically, knowing about which investigations you may or decide, may decide not to do, but if you're going to investigate them, how are you going to make sure that's done in a timely manner? And if you're actually getting down into the how you repair a biceps tendon, um, one, one incision, two incision or whatever, you're really then in the, in the sort of seven level. Moving on to some elective topics, um, shoulder instability, but we talked about that, frozen shoulder, arthritis and cuff disease. Um, yeah, frozen shoulders, a good thing, good question, because it's common and there's a lot to discuss. Um, what are the associations? How do they present? Um, and how do you manage them? So injections, physio, I think these days really we'd be expected to, to know about hydrodilatation as a good option, although it's sort of not great levels of evidence yet. Um, and surgery manipulation versus released um, UK frost effectively told us that there was no great difference. But that to me, if you quoted that, would be definitely seven or eight territory. Um, but yeah, sensible approach, the patient in front of you and so on, as we've seen with everything else. And I think, yeah, arthritis in the shoulder is broadly speaking, unless you include all the, you know, the increasingly rare inflammatory and so on, really knowing the difference between um, osteoarthritis and cuff tear arthropathy and why it makes a difference. So how is it going to affect your management? Um, what are the mechanics of reverse shoulder arthroplasty? Why does an anatomical total arthroplasty not work in cuff tear arthropathy? Um, and it, it comes down to stability, basically. It's not, I don't think it's much to do with center of rotation or anything else. I think that the key thing you've got in this x-ray is an unstable shoulder. It just happens to be unstable superiorly because there's no restraint from the cuff. And when you put a, well, I don't want to say constrained, but I suppose it is a ball and socket joint in, in whatever way you do, you make it a stable joint and therefore the other muscles can, can mobilize it. So I think it's more about that than anything else. So Anyway, that's debatable, but knowing the difference between the two, knowing what difference it makes to your treatment, I think all of that comes together quite nicely into a, a question. And rotator cuff disease, so I'm not talking about acute traumatic rotator cuff tears. I think you know, we know that most people should be considered for repair for a, a big rotator cuff tear that's due to trauma. Um, smaller tears, that's different, but anyway. But in, when it comes to chronic rotator cuff disease, the point is that most of us walking around this planet after the age of 40, 50, 60 or whatever have ab abnormalities of our rotator cuff on imaging. So it's a real classical treating the patient, not the scan sort of thing. Non-operative treatment is the way forward initially. Um, and then when it comes to repair, if you're going, to, well, firstly, there's the talk of you know, arthroscopic decompression, which really seesaw trial uh, told us that it doesn't do what we think it does. It does something um, because people who had surgery were better than people who didn't have surgery. But the someone keeps muting me. Um, <laughs> is it a hint? Um, you know, see, seesaw tells us that arthroscopic subacromial decompression it's not about removing a bit of bone, et cetera. It's probably more about stirring up a healing process or something of that, of that line. Um, but if you know about the seesaw trial, again, um, if you know about U-cuff, which basically said open and arthroscopic cuff repair was pretty much the same. And if you know about the controversies around balloons with a recent article in The Lancet, um, you know, you're getting into seven and eight territory. Um, and then just being very cynical, there's so much money thrown at rotator cuff management surgically and there's very little evidence for any of it if we're honest 
Anyway, that's just my, my bugbear of my career. Elective topics in the elbow, arthritis, arthroplasty, tendinopathies. So classically, we've seen a lot more inflammatory arthropathy in the elbow than OA, but I think that's probably swung almost full, full the other way now. Um, you know, diagnosis and management in terms of, uh, you know, conservative management, management of inflammatory disease. <coughs> when it comes to OA, what are your principles of surgery? Well, you can do a do a joint release. You can do sort of debridement procedures um, in terms of removing osteophyte. Arthroscopy of the elbow is pretty high level knowledge. I think if you, I wouldn't expect anyone to really be able to talk me through how they do an you know an arthroscopic debridement of the elbow because I certainly don't know. So you know, having a knowledge of elbow arthroscopy is fine, but beyond that is probably above the scope of the day one consultant. I would argue. And when it comes to arthroplasty, you know, a knowledge of the designs, I think is probably what I'd say is the, is the sort of level six, knowing there are linked and unlinked designs. Um, I just put up this picture. This is a design where there's lots of different options. I don't happen to use it, by the way, but anyway, it just, you know, there's the hemiarthroplasty option that can be linked or it can be unlinked um, and know why you might use those. So linkage obviously uh, confers stability, which is important in inflammatory disease or the unstable but stable arthritic elbow. Whereas an unlinked design might be reasonable in uh, earlier stage arthritis when there is stability. Um, so, yeah, being able to talk about that, that's certainly, yeah, that's certainly a reasonable uh, level. If you know that there's a move towards regional elbow hubs um, because of GERFT, uh, et cetera, then that's certainly a higher level. But if you haven't heard about it, that's probably something just, just worth knowing. So... In summary, I think just try, again, it's easy for me to say, try and keep it in perspective. Try to know that there's a high pass rate, that everyone's, by definition, we're a self-selecting bunch of nice people, to be honest. I mean, we do give up two or three weekends a year to do the exam, for which we admittedly get expenses and we get a couple of evenings out for nice food, but we don't get paid for it. Um, and we... You know, we're doing it because we believe in it and we because we see it as a very rewarding professional activity. At the end of the day, firstly, you're sitting down and getting great, great CPD. If you usually are an upper limb surgeon, and you sit down, and you have to do basic science or as I have in the past do kids or a load of questions about hip arthroplasty. That's that's great. It's great for me to keep my knowledge up. It's also great for you as a candidate, because the more expert you are, the more expert examiner you have, probably they're setting the standards a bit higher. Um, if you tell me something that I don't know about shoulder or elbow arthroplasty, you know, I'm gonna be quite surprised, but it, you know, you can have a fairly standard level of knowledge for most subjects otherwise, and I'll, you know, I'll be with you on it. And I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's reasonable to know. Um, but we're a nice bunch of people. We are trying to, trying to pass you, but at the same time, the key thing is that it's it is a safeguarding issue in some ways, if that's the right phrase. It is a quality assurance exercise. If you really get philosophical about it, you know, you, the public are entrusting us with the decision as to whether candidates fulfill the criteria to be a to be a consultant and let loose to do that job. So it, it's a great responsibility as well. And if, if candidates are not up to scratch, we have to be prepared to, to say that. Bear in mind that phrase again, the competence, knowledge and management of common problems. If you have that, you're going to get through. If you demonstrate that at every stage of the exam, you're going to get through. Um, if you know more, that's great. And bear in mind, if you fall down somewhere, you get a five or even a four. That's OK, but you're going to have to get a seven or an eight somewhere else. So you'd have to be very careful to set your sights at slightly above the pass because otherwise if you do have a problem you're not going to be able to pick yourself up so if you know more that's great but in the questions no one's trying to trick you start with the basics start with safe assessment and build it up from there and be guided and don't just go for broke and mention loads of crazy papers straight away because that's not going to make any friends so um i will unshare uh if i'm absolutely happy if people contact me, not too, I mean, there's about 300 of you, 95, um, you know, don't inundate me. But if you've got any questions, 
you know, I'm happy to be to be contacted. Um, but uh, otherwise, I guess we'll we'll open it up. I think. Thank you very much, Mr. Clock. That was wonderful. Um, there was very comprehensive overview of the exam and the standards expected of uh, our candidates. And it's really, really very realistic, very reassuring and eye-opener as well on a lot of things you said. Um, it's very interesting to hear, um, you know, we all know it's set up at uh, day one level consultant. Uh, and uh, one of the questions that have been asked about the MCQs is, is what if everyone answers correctly at the day one level? Or not everyone, maybe 90%. Can 90% can, can pass? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If 90% of the candidates demonstrate the level to be a day one consultant, yeah. the answer is yes. Now, clearly that doesn't happen, but the, no. yeah. Yeah, the, the pass mark is set according to what we judge the level of the exam to yeah. be. That's what it ultimately is. So if everyone coming to the yeah. exam is demonstrating that level, everyone will pass. So it, that's that's why you can't, it would be very unfair to say, well, actually only 50% of people can pass. Well, what if they're all great? It, that yeah. doesn't make any sense and arbitrarily setting a pass mark otherwise. So so it's very, I, I didn't know any of this till I became an examiner, but the, the way the, the, the single best answer paper is set is fascinating really i mean there's bits of the statistics i don't understand but it, it does aim to give you that you know here is what you the panel have judged the level of this exam to be based upon that level six and therefore these are the people who have passed and it's it seems to do it and again i mentioned a few times it is all very much gmc um not run because it isn't, but it's uh, it's GMC regulated, it's GMC approved. So, you know, from a from a safety point of view, lovely. Well, that's very interesting and reassuring as well. So it's not a pass rate; they don't have to pass fifty percent or sixty or seventy percent. No, no. They can pass. Obviously, it doesn't happen. Doesn't happen, but it might. It's not like interviews when only one person get the job here. Yeah. Everyone can get it. You are, you are being judged <laughs> against a standard. Yeah. And that's and if you meet that standard, you are going to get through. And that's you know, it's like I'd say there's a 70% pass mark as a trainee doing the part two. That's not that we pass 70% of people, it's just that roughly speaking, 70% of people that come to the exam demonstrate that standard. So that's it's not that you will, you know, if you're unfortunately one of the other 30. You know it wasn't just not your day you just didn't demonstrate that standard so it's it's really important to know all this that's that's yeah. what it's about is it's just achieving a certain level of higher order thinking is a phrase i haven't used yet but that that's what it's about it's not about knowledge and it's not you know no actually writing the single best answer questions is phenomenally difficult if you follow the rules if you take a topic and you try to write a question that fits the bill i.e all of the options should be reasonable one is you know a better answer than the others because there are things in the curriculum so we, I'm, i've started off again now but anyway the there are things the exam should cover the curriculum and in the curriculum it might say hand approaches well how many approaches are there in the hand but in there it says in the if you look at the the there's a thing called the gap analysis which tells you which questions are required you might see you need to write a single best answer question on the hand approaches. Well, immediately you think, well, how am I going to do that? How on earth can you write something where you've got to choose one of five approaches to the hand? You have to then start and think a bit laterally and think, well, actually, in this approach, what, you know, what nerve might be at risk or in this approach, this nerve or in that approach, the other nerve. And then you realize you have to know all of the approaches and know them in some detail in order to choose the one that's best for that. So you have to get working to a very high level in order to actually get these questions written. Um, and if you see a question that's one is the obvious answer, that's not a question that's getting in the exam. And I, I'm not sure, I know one of my colleagues is, is heavily involved in UKITE and I, I, I don't know what the standard there is, but certainly it used to be a sort of fairly fairly basic level of questions that went in it, but hopefully that's that's improved since. Yeah, yeah. We do get uh, being teaching on 
um, on, on various um, courses, we get a lot of people um, complaining. They say, oh, I did very well in the theory exam, but this time the pass rate was high. They set it up at yeah. 70%, well, 80%. It's it's not like that. You clearly explained. It's, it isn't. Yeah, I'm no one, not. no complaint about that. It's, it doesn't it, help. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, do you want me? I mean, I'm looking at the questions here. I can. Yes. I mean, Harvard, yeah. I'll start from the first. So, so yes, please. Yeah. Um, someone's asking if, if the candidate quotes evidence early but didn't meet the requirements for a six, would that help them to pass? Well, the answer is probably no, because well, if your evidence got you to answer the question to the level six, then you would pass. But if you quote evidence that doesn't back up the management that's the level six, then you wouldn't, you see what I mean? So let's say, I mean, there's evidence and there's evidence, isn't there? So let's say you're talking about supracondylar fracture and you read some paper somewhere that said that, um, you know, a pulsed ultrasound is good for supracondylar fractures. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, you quoted evidence, but you didn't manage the case appropriately for a day one consult. So, you, you know, it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but just quoting evidence is not necessarily going to demonstrate that you're competent to be a day one consultant. In fact, it may, may mean the opposite. It may be that if you start quoting weird and wonderful evidence, but can't actually demonstrate that you can safely manage the patient in front of you, that's going to be very counterproductive. And in fact, potentially dangerous so so that answers that one i, I think um yeah. if you're quoting evidence how much of the paper do you need to know i i mean don't worry you know don't overthink the evidence thing as I've, I've pointed out a few things in my specialist area that you may want to be aware of if you're just aware of it that's fine but really don't focus on it just just get yourself to the level six just answer things safely and competently and know how to manage patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And if there's something you can quote, even if you just mention, you might say, oh, I think I read a paper last week about this. That in itself is fine. So really, 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 really don't waste your time going down the evidence route. I couldn't stress that strongly enough. If you're the sort of person who just has an encyclopedic knowledge of stuff, that's great. I don't, I can rarely quote anything. I mean, all the things I mentioned are just pretty big things that you know most of us in the shoulder and elbow world know but I couldn't quote you, you know, older, older evidence. Um, current indication of shoulder hemming. Well, I won't go into that in too much because that's not really the scope of it, but um, it depends if we're talking about trauma or elective. If we're talking about elective, I mean, really, we know that in osteoarthritis, total arthroplasty do a lot better than hemiarthroplasty. So in the last, since I became a consultant, the pendulum has swung well away from any sort of hemi, including resurfacing through to total because we just know patients do better, which is not surprising because hemis don't do great in most things. Um, if you're talking about trauma, the really, really, really key thing is ending up with a competent rotator cuff. So if you have a fit, healthy patient who's got a good rotator cuff, you do a nice, and it's, it's important to, to be putting in your implant such that the rotator cuff ends up where it should be, then um, you can do very well. The problem is that in older patients, they either don't have a very good rotator cuff or the tuberosities don't heal, or it's just technically not done well. And that's why it gets a bad name. So I, I do shoulder hemi. I, I do them for trauma occasionally still in younger people. And that's what Profit 2 is. Profit 2 is hemi versus reverse versus conservative treatment in over 65s. So that we need that because everyone thinks they know best and everyone thinks that a reverse is best, but we don't really know. But in elective, in the elective scenario, I can't remember the last hemi of any sort I did in the elective scenario. Next one. Um, in COVID exam, what's the major difference in expectations in short cases versus viva? Well, the mark scheme is the same. The criteria I showed you, um, it's just a different swing on it really so if you you know you'll, you'll be marked against those same standards but if you and i would go back to it but i won't look it up look it look it up on there and because some of it is is particular to the clinical scenario so on the right hand column it, it includes the kind of interaction with patients which clearly you can't do in the in the in the um in the current scenarios but um in the actual, you know, in face-to-face -face clinical scenarios, you get, you know, you get one set of marks for how you interact with the patient. So the, the expectations are the same. You are being judged against the day one consultant, but you're being judged by your history taking as opposed to your 
knowledge of this. So it's, it's just slightly different, but it is otherwise the same. Um, what are the challenges for a non-trainee to pass the exam? Um, that's a good question, because we spend every time we do the exam, we have a mandated equality and diversity talk. Because we do know that the pass rate amongst some groups is lower than it is amongst others. And that may be because of uh, the proportion that are trainees as opposed to non-trainees. Um, you know, we're always trying to recruit, improve the diversity in the examiner fraternity as well, and they've said fraternity, so that was me showing my bias, in the examiner group, um, uh, you know, because traditionally examiners have been white males, but, you know, we're hopefully improving on that. I, I think challenges for a non-trainee to pass, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether it's a bit self-selecting or whether it's, it's um, you know, that you just haven't been through a training program that gives you a teaching session every week. Um, I think it's difficult. I, I, I think it's difficult. I think, you know, the, the advantages of moving from place to place and doing different jobs um, and seeing how people do things differently and having a teaching program, all those things sort of build things up. So I, I, I wouldn't like to say there's any one factor in a non-trainee passing the exam from the examiner point of view, because I know someone else has mentioned it. Do we know? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have no idea. We have a number and a name, and that is all we know. And clearly that is how it should be. Um, so, you know, we have, going back to the equality and diversity, we have a, uh, you know, a talk about bias, um, being aware of unconscious bias and all that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I haven't got answers to those questions. Why is the pass mark lower? I don't know. Is there any way you can improve on that? I don't know. I mean, I think looking at the curriculum, trying to work towards it and hopefully paying attention to what I've said will help. I don't know. Um, in the opening line, Viva recommends to go straight to the diagnosis. I mentioned it. Don't, it says in the opening line in the Viva, is it recommended to go straight into diagnosis or remain with differential diagnosis in the count? Don't overthink it. Be guided by what's happening. If you do be safe, um, if something is obviously something and you really think that, then probably you're right. And we would be a little bit worried if something was obviously, uh, I don't know, there was obvious tumour or something and someone said, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be the other. You might be better to say, well, I'm worried this, is, or say what you're worried about. It's a good way to do it. I'm looking at this. I'm concerned there may be a tumour. There are other things it could be, but this is my worry. You know, that's a good way to answer a question. You're telling the examiner, I'm being safe. If someone, if there's an obvious tumour and you mess around for five minutes telling us all the other things it could be, we're going to worry that you don't know what it is. Do you see, see what that point is? I think it's... Um, I think it's difficult, but don't, there are no rules. There's no guidance. You're not expected to do this or expected to do that. Do what feels right. If you think you know the answer, by all means, say it, because we might be expecting you to say it. So don't think, oh, I know it's this, but I'm going to say a load of other stuff first. Don't, don't think that that's, that's necessarily need, what you need to do. Um, the training program, we mentioned that. Master's degree in orthopedics get an exemption. No, that's the answer, <laughs> that's the answer to that. Um, uh, there was a direct question to me, I think, um, which I think I'm just reading it before I share it, but I think it's reasonable to say uh, the trauma table is one of the commonest Viber tables to fail. Um, why is that? I think it's a good point. Our perception is that the trauma aspect should be something that you manage very easily. So I think probably the level six, and I did trauma last time, there are a lot of questions that, well, actually, all of this is level six. You can't really score very highly on it. And equally, it's easy to score low. If you can't manage common problems in trauma, you are below the standard of a day one consultant managing trauma by definition. So um, I think that's probably how it is. And it's hard to get a seven and eight. It really is because it's all hopefully a lot of it is just bread and butter stuff you should know how to manage so i think that's probably the answer to that question it's just a lot is expected of you because you should achieve it fairly easily um i think that's probably probably the point um 
what is the recommended way for candidates to introduce themselves to the patient? Um, I, I think in the clinicals, what I think looks and works best, we are expecting you to have a good relationship to, with the patient. And I think a good way to do it uh, from an examiner's point of view is the candidate really just talks to the patient, but tells us what they're doing, if you see what I mean. So you might say, oh, I see you've got a scar here. Could you tell me what that was from? Or do you, you know, um, do you have any family history of something or do you, so you, you, your relationship is purely with the patient, but you're telling us what you know by asking the patient the right questions. And I think that's a really good skill to get because you look like you're re really interacting well with the patient. Someone saying, oh, this lady has this and they've got this and they're obese and all, <laughs> it just, it just doesn't look good. Um, so just just interacting with the patient and, and just go with the flow, if you know what I mean. You know, people say, should I examine this? Should I examine this? Well, if you think you should, then yes, you know, we're kind of just here observing. And it's only when you get to the discussion point. So in the in the in the face to face, um, the face to face uh, intermediates, at five minutes or so, well, would you like to summarize the history? So you just take the history from the patient and then would you like to summarize the history? And then you examine the patient, would you like to summarize your findings? And right now we're going to discuss it, but the patient's there. So you're really still discussing it in, in the realm of the patient consultation. So it's all about, well, it's not all about, but a lot of it is about the patient, the patient interaction, which I would really recommend is, so when you, when you say introduce the candidate, how it, introduce yourself to the, um, to the patient however you feel is comfortable really um uh, you know and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give you marks if you're nice to them pretty much <laughs> it's not it's not rocket science i think that's probably that's all the questions there are on the chat i think yes um, that's uh, all the questions we have uh, so far um we're very happy to take more questions if anyone has but i think this um really covered quite a lot um already um, i can I, I mean, I, my my colleagues who just did the exam, um, I get, yeah. So I, again, it's it's I just not giving too much away because I don't want to sort of tell you what you know what. But these are questions in the bank, and there's absolutely no guarantee they may disappear. All the, the idea, I think, the G, what the GMC want to do, which would be very hard because it's hard to maintain the question bank anyway, um, is uh, the questions are used once and then then binned which would clearly be best for best for sort of quality assurance but at the same time virtually unmanageable um so i'm just getting to ask so so an upper limb intermediate case someone with scap a young patient with scapular winging so uh, being asked about what the causes are um what are they examining why are they examining that how would they examine the, the periscapular nerves and muscles what are the causes of winging, etc.? So that that that's all all there. Um, capitellum fracture for trauma, which is fairly bread and butter, really. How you manage it, from my point of view, as a as an elbow surgeon, I kind of want to know why you would choose a particular approach because you can certainly go wrong with it. That's what I would say with that. Um, a tumor in a shoulder. Well, that's. Um, supracondylar fracture well that's just you just if you want to get through the exam just know supracondylar fractures inside out because it's just absolutely bread and butter stuff um more viva stuff for humoral non-union and bear in mind i'm telling you these headings i mean just knowing there's a humoral non-union doesn't tell you what the question is because we could want various things out of that and that's what i mean if you see it well that's a humoral non-union well where am i i'm in basic science maybe this is going to be a question about bone healing I'm in trauma, maybe this is going to be a question about how I'm actually going to manage it. So, you know, the same thing can come up in different aspects and, and be and go in very different directions. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just give you a sort of very broad idea of, of sort of things that are there. None of these are weird and wonderful, though, are they? Um, you know, irreducible shoulder dislocation, what would you do? Supracondylar again. Um, Distal biceps, we mentioned that. Um, Jupiterans, clearly Jupiterans. Oh, this guy got distal biceps twice. Um, you know, all, all, all things I mentioned. I mean, obviously, what happens is that the, the, uh, 
those of us who write questions tend to find an interesting case and write a question around it, which isn't necessarily the most beneficial thing. What we should do is take a bit of the curriculum and find a question that, that fits that. So what you tend to find is that common things like trauma, lots of people write trauma questions because people see trauma and they go, that's an interesting trauma case and they write it up as a question. Um, and just, just, just talking a little bit about question writing, just so you know, because uh, I, I sort of mentioned it, but if, if I decide to sit down and write a question, that then goes to JCIE, to the question bank managers, and then every three or four months, there's the written paper question writing group, and there's the, the uh, oral question writing group, and the, the sort of a separate section for the clinicals now. So the questions that have been submitted go to those panels. So you then sit down and discuss them and vet them and maybe even rewrite them to make sure that they're of a, of a good standard uh, for the exam. Um, but yeah, so, so certain things that are a bit more esoteric in the, in the realm of the curriculum. Because if you look at the curriculum, let's mention this, there's a lot of stuff in there that you don't get many questions about. And I'm thinking about things like consenting, ethics, um, professional behavior, it's all in there. So don't be absolutely surprised if you go in and someone asks you, you know, how are you going to consent this patient? What, what are the principles? Um, what would you say is a significant risk? What would you say is a common risk? All these things are a fair game for the exam. They for some reason, they tend to be in the, in the basic science, which really throws people. But there are ethical questions in there and professional questions. So probably something we should have more of because although you discuss these things and you're assessed on them through your training, it's, it's reasonable to have them in the exam as well. Lovely. So, uh, Mr. Clock, I, any more of uh, those candid experiences, questions, or? Uh... I thought I had more, but as I'm looking at them, I'm thinking I'm just going to be very brief well, on them. You covered it, actually, as you said, yeah, in your, when so. you, you covered the, 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 the main, main topic that can be asked, and I think that's exactly what you said, yeah. The point is that anything can be asked. Yeah. If it's in the curriculum, there should be, or may not be, but there should be a question on it. So, you yeah. know, nothing, nothing, everything's fair game, and it's just how you approach it with a rational mind and deal with the problem based on your knowledge and experience and everything else. And that's, that's what, at the end of the day, that's what being a consultant is about, and that's, that's why that's the standard that's being assessed. In a way or another, we all know the questions. Mm. Okay, just we need to know they have different approaches, different yeah. angles to each question and yeah. and different depth and different scenarios and challenges. They can put it to you and different tables. You just mm. that's how you you you're showing yourself as a consultant, isn't it? By by able well, to think manage a, that. If if and I'm sure there is somewhere, but yeah, if if candidates come in and come out and as they do write down their experience, that's fine. But that doesn't necessarily equate to you. Because that question may come up again or it may not and if it does come up it might be rewritten slightly or the examiner asking the question may do it a slightly different way or they might say you might say something that they take it down a different route so actually knowing you know as you absolutely rightly said that knowing the questions is not actually that helpful um being able to manage yourself in that scenario is the thing that's helpful and i so whenever I don't do Viva practice with trainees generally. What I do is I give them the sort of information I've given now. I, I think that's more important to you. And, you know, and equally a bit of a two-way street. My, my wife's a colleague and she did the exam a few years ago. She went on a course and came back and told me about it. And I was just shocked that this thing could happen. It was just awful. It was the worst, you know, it was absolutely it bore no resemblance whatsoever to the exam or the level it was pitched at. And it's quite a famous course, um, which I presume is still running. And there's, you know, there's not a lot you can do about that. People go and do famous courses because they're famous. And it was a decidedly unhelpful experience for, I can tell you. So I don't know, it would be, I think this, this sort of thing I've talked about, hopefully being in the public domain is, is just of, of use and people knowing knowing what it's really about is a is a good thing because we are yeah we are trying to be helpful it's just difficult that we can't tell you directly well that's, that's definitely very helpful and as you said there are a lot of historical things like i was very interesting what you mentioned that's um 
candidates don't have to say inappropriately consented and 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 position patient or whatever uh, uh, and mark patient yeah, yeah it's it really disappeared about a year ago it was literally overnight so yeah was that, we sort of meet a coughing it did did everyone say that yeah everyone said that Where's it's that? standard now now everyone says it whenever they ask any question about a surgical approach surgical management and and we, we when we teach exactly it has suddenly increased and i'll be honest with you um when i we are teaching driver people i i'm finding it difficult to tell them not don't say this because i don't know maybe that's mm. an, an examiner somewhere well, told I mean, them to have to do it yeah. don't get me wrong no, one, no one's gonna say it but you'll probably see someone smile a bit and think oh there we go again um <laughs> but yeah i'm just it's just a little bit it's interesting and it's it's not it's not wrong obviously it's not wrong it's just it's just quite amusing that i think it was probably about 18 months ago suddenly everyone said it and it's yeah really um <laughs> the questions just come through anything's like yeah. that that irritates it down well I, I don't think irritation is the right word i think i think one thing that gets in a candidate who clearly is demonstrating good level of knowledge and assessment and judgment because that's the important things not just knowledge it, it, it's disappointing sometimes when people just kind of won't commit to to doing something that you can try to be too safe at the end of the day in that five minute period you're you've got to demonstrate that you know what you're doing basically um and if you if you mess around so long that you waste half that time yeah you might get to the six eventually but we feel oh yeah what a shame if only they'd said that you know two minutes earlier or if only they committed a bit earlier or you know it is about being safe but there's a way it's like what i said about the tumor if something obviously looks worrying say you're worried if and then you might say well actually it could be a lot of other things but this is the big thing i want to worry about then you've you've demonstrated both your knowledge and your experience and your judgment and that all looks good if you if you if you mess around too long and try to be too safe and spend lots of time talking about something that doesn't really get you anywhere yeah you're being safe but you may be being too safe and that i can't tell you what that where that line is and, and that's the point i think it's not a line it's a it's a very sort of fluid situation and it's a very much a judgment based on what's actually happening to you at that time and what picking up on the clues and the body language of the examiner a little bit maybe although we shouldn't be doing anything too body languagey um but you know just try and try and think what this is there's a point to this question it's not it's not just talking about this x-ray for five minutes it is coming to a diagnosis and it is treating the patient so you know in trauma just spending five minutes talking about something fairly irrelevant is not necessarily going to get you very far so so it's not about it's not really about irritation i don't think anyone you're not going to get marked down because you irritate someone a bit um but it's just a bit disappointing sometimes that's that's how i'd say it and sometimes a bit funny that's okay we can put up with being <laughs> amused slightly but it, but if you you know if you make the examiner laugh it's probably a good thing no one's going to laugh if you're saying something crazy so you know a, a bit of banter a bit of light-heartedness it, do, it does as i did say it does go a long way people being a bit happy and it, dare i say it it's quite fun uh, it's easy if you pass i say to say that but my trainee did the exam last time and i said well you know what do you think so actually i actually kind of see what you mean it was you know it was stressful but it's your chance to go and demonstrate that you you know you deserve to be there and that the the chairman of the board of examiners when i when i did the exam i remember him a guy called um jimmy hutchinson i think he's in aberdeen he's retired but he jumped up on the table and just gave us this great pep talk you all deserve to be here and just show them what you're made of and yeah. it's great and enjoy your day and all this so wow and that, so he came to the 30th anniversary dinner a few weeks ago and i just had not seen him since and i just wanted to say, i just wanted to say thank you because it really meant a lot so um you know that that sort of enjoyment level if you can if you can see it see an enjoyment in it you're going to have a much better time of it yeah totally agree and we we try to encourage that feeling of gratitude as well and and feeling of achievement that you haven't got there that far so easily in your career you've done yeah, so yeah. much you've it's an achievement to be sitting there 
in front of those examiners and and you you do very definitely deserve to be there yeah so just just give it your you know everything mm. you can yeah that's brilliant that's great well thank you very much mr Clark, for, for this wonderful lecture and for being with us and giving us all these insights it was really really very useful indeed Good. Um, and we appreciate um, the time you've given us um, and the preparation and everything um, and obviously, um, yeah, we'll let you know if I get any more questions uh, later on. We'll send yeah. them to you. I probably have 300 emails tonight. <laughs> you, 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 your email will crash tomorrow. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I think everyone is, is grateful to you and uh, uh, lots of thank you messages. Um, so um, I think we will finish this session now if everyone is, uh, is is happy. Again, thank you very much to Mr. Cloak and, and we we'll hope to see you again and all the best and thank you for being an examiner as well. Poss um, possibly see some of you over the table. <laughs> some of, some exa yeah, exactly. Some of, of people here will might be candidates in front of you, but at least now they know what you're expecting from them. Yeah. They do will not misinterpret or misread you and and they and and the other examiners and that they will be in a better position to be themselves in the day. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people are a little bit poker face, but we're we're all nice people, and it is yeah. um, it is worth uh, it is worth remembering that. Well, definitely, and uh, we we're all colleagues anyway. At the end of the day, exactly. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Again, Mr. Clock, okay. and thank you everyone who attended this meeting. Um, uh, and thanks to the team from ORUK, to Hannah and Didia for organizing this. Much appreciated and for, to keep this teaching program going. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Um, good night. Thank Just reply with one message. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's gone. I was answering a question. He's gone. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Bye then. Bye.
Thank you.